people are just struggling in this world. They're struggling. Sometimes they're confused. Sometimes they're, you know, people are just trying to find happiness and joy. And what good, if they're going to hate you, what good is to hate back? That's petty. We're not in the game of pettiness. That's that's like uh, one dog fighting another dog. We got to be much above that. So just by those prayers, and I don't know why they came out, but they spontaneously came out. I felt so free to wish them well, mm. you know? That was just today? That was just this morning. Nice. I can help you. Do you need help? I do. With some of this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Come on! Live from Rishikesh, this is Wisdom of the Sages. A daily spiritual podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bakke Center in New York City, Coast Yubadas. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Rishikesh, India. This is the land of the yogis and of American YTT teacher trainings. Mm -hmm. I somehow got... <laughs> We're just uh, wrapping up. We have one more full day here tomorrow. Yeah. We had a great day. I, I, I got sick. I got sick. I was out. Kostuba took everybody to uh, Vashishta Guha today, which was beautiful, I'm sure. The cave of the great sage Vashishta. It is. Uh, that's one of my happy places, Vashishta Guha. That place was so... One, it was like the dream ashram. I know. Me and Kostuba, you know how New Yorkers look for it like, oh, I wish I had that apartment. I wish I had that apartment. <laughs> we do that with ashram. Yeah. We're like, I want that ashram. <laughs> I mean, the location, the, the, the river is so beautiful there. It's on the banks of the Ganga. Yeah. There's just like, and it's not going to get flooded. You can tell it's like high enough, yeah. but it's deep down. So you don't hear all the cars so much. That's right. Exactly. It's deep down. And you have the cave. If yeah. you don't want to hear any cars, you go deep into that cave. There's a rumor that that cave used to go all the way to Hater Nath. I, I went. I thought to Budgie Nath. I don't know. I saw it. You saw it. No. I could see the path. No, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful place and just wonderful. I mean, I don't want to sound cliche. The energy there was great, but the energy there was really great. <laughs> in the cave, outside the cave, in the water, on the bank, everywhere. Yeah. That was a place to meditate. That was a place to spend good time. And we had an incredible day in Hadidwar, which is just about an hour south downstream. The gateway, right. the dwar, the door to Hari. For people start their Char Dham Yatra when they go to visit the four Dhams of the Himalayas. And we had a great day there. Beautiful day. They drained the Ganga. The Ganga was drained, like diverted around that Hari Pisori, the main village. area. And people, when they have a a deity, a Morti, that's maybe chipped or a little broken and can't be worshipped anymore, then they take it and they drop it in the river. There. They come from all over India and put their old deities in the river. And that's just sort of like, you know, now we... You don't want to throw it in the garbage, but you can't worship it anymore. So you drop it in the river. And so, yeah, about 15 years back, we went there with a pilgrimage, and it was at this time, our hotel was right on the Ganga. Yeah. And I came, and I was like, what the heck? What happened to the Ganga today? The hotel <laughs> owner's like, draining Ganga. I was like, what? <laughs> and then, um, but there's these Mortis, these really cool Mortis. It's like, it's right out of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's, it's surreal. It's it's surreal. There's Mortis that are- It's like God you're on the moon. How many, and how there's many all these Mortis of, there. Thousands of years old, these deities are being yeah. worshipped. So it was- you can Go there and find them. Find some cool deity. To, yeah. So that was cool too. That was a great day. And then we had a great Kirtan. Incredible Kirtan uh, and Puja. Which is still on my Instagram. If you want to see it? That I'm going to take it down. That scene in Hardwar, during the Ganga Puja, in all the little temples that are there on the bank. Yeah, that is that seems like the birthplace of Indian kitsch in the best way. <laughs> you know, like right. all the colors. The whole scene is so cool. You know, Ferdy said to me, "He's like, what was the festival?" 
Like, <laughs> no, this is it every it. day. This is, this is business as usual here. You get 10,000 people packing on the steps, waving the lots of flowers. Lamps. It was yeah. a, another one of those like American fire marshal disasters, yeah. like flowing robes, lots of ghee, flames. What could go wrong? A lot of devotion, a lot of women, devotion. Women with oiled hair. <laughs> it's like everything. The guy behind us was doing huge circle circles of flames. People were ducking. Yeah. Um. Oh, right, but that was though. yesterday. That was yesterday. Okay, on to today's show. Why are we we're looking forward to this? And then we're here up in uh, Rishi Case Whoop. at MBT, which yeah. I've never been to. They've developed this nice facility. The street. This was never here. This was fields. Yeah. I and mean, now it's like a whole yoga central up this road. So I'm telling you. Walk. Yeah. So we're doing Kirtan right after this. Looking oh, forward to it. Great. Today's Q&A day, everybody. If you're new to this program, welcome. Every Saturday, we do questions and answers. So today we're taking questions from our live group. Usually people write them in, but uh, we're going to invite people up that are on pilgrimage with us. But before we do that. But before we do that, we got a lot of interesting announcements. From Mara. Well, Mara's not going to do it. Oh, I don't think. Okay. She passed it to me. Oh, do you want that uh, thing that was up before? Is that it? Mara's one of those people. There's two types of people. One who want to be on screen all the time and one who'd never want to be on screen anytime. She's on every day. <laughs> Somehow you got roped into this karma. Okay, here's the announcements. Welcome to the show. No, that's not it. John Lohr. Well, I didn't say it. This is episode 1454. Okay. I didn't say that yet. It's October 26th. Uh, Wisdom of the Sages is hosting our second annual spiritual treat in the sacred city of Mayapur. Reach it. There'll be a treat, but it'll it's be a, a, oh, a spiritual it's a treat. treat. Okay. <laughs> In the sacred city of Mayapur. Mayapur is the birthplace of ecstatic kirtan, so this retreat can't be missed. Some of the highlights will include excursions to powerful holy places, including Lord Chaitanya's birthplace, Srivast Thakur's house, where loving ecstasy of kirtan overflowed, the Jagannath Mandir, a Ganga sunset boat ride, nice. and visit this uh, visit to surrounding villages. Uh, for more information, email wisdom of the sages 108 at gmail.com to let us know you're interested and in, in attending or for more info. And also the show will be at 7 30 a.m. Eastern time again tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? You didn't mention anything about my vest I'm wearing here. I wore a new vest here. Roganos vest. I thought I'd impress you, Christina. Definitely the thing on this retreat it's beautiful <laughs> it's regal. i bought a lot of vests in india but this is like uh people just look at him and they know he's the guy the maharaj is, the maharaj has arisen, <laughs> has arisen. Has, uh, <laughs> has arisen. <laughs> all right ready for some questions yes what questions I, who's first i think katie's first she's got a very katie katie wake off yep Come on up, Katie. You got to come right between Katie, us. Come on down. Was she on the other day? Let's hear, for, let's hear for Katie, Harry Ball. We have special mics. No one can even hear any of that, but it was nice to get the support. Hey, Katie, how are you? Great. How are y'all how are y'all doing today? Was <laughs> what, were you just on the show last? Yeah, you were. I hope it wasn't the same question. <laughs> you had two questions, right? You had the, two questions. Let, let's hear your question this time. Katie's from Virginia, Newport News, 24 years old. Listens to the podcast every day for four years. She's one of the people, I think, it's one of those picking up from last life things. We're like fixed in Bhakti. As soon as she heard about it, like fixed. This is me. I totally get this. I've been waiting for this my entire life. Yeah. I was like, they had to. I, I was, was I, walking around with a little next to Krishna in a basket. <laughs> Everywhere she goes. <laughs> yeah, I was one of those. I was, I was, I was, uh, Kicking and fighting not to get into bhakti for years. All right. <laughs> but she was just like, I opt in right. for pure devotional service. Katie, what's your question for today? Talking to Kastuba's mic, put your face right there. Well, thank you guys for such your kind words. Um, my question comes from a couple hundred episodes ago. Amy Steller asked a question about resentment. And my question, again, because so Kastuba's answer was the key to resentment is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's something that conceptually I like the idea of, but also at the same time, I'm not quite sure what exactly is forgiveness or how do you actually fully find that forgiveness in your heart and like liberate yourself of that resentment? Boom. Great question. It's kind of like, what's the key to resentment? 
getting over resentment, the key is forgiveness. Okay, but then what's the key to forgiveness? It's like locks. It's like you open up a lock and then there's another lock. It's like the Russian uh, <laughs> dolls that are in a doll in a oh, doll. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a good. Uh, can I start this one? You know why? As you like. Because as you guys were off on your extravaganza to Vish Vishista's cave, me and Mara, you know, I slept in, was not feeling well. And then um, we went to the uh, Ganga and took bath. And then we sat by the Ganga and said prayers for everybody that we could possibly think of with our brains. Wow. And was, I, on, was, was I included? Yes, you are. Okay. Yes, you were included. You were too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Um, but after you do your pray for my kids, pray for my mom, pray for, you know, after you've run through the, the, the then I started praying for the people that re have really hurt me, uh -oh. that really, really hurt me. And the more you pray for people that have really like, they've really wronged you, you know, sometimes you, you love a person so much and they repay you with like nastiness. Ever have that happen? Yeah. No, just you, Raghu. Nope. <laughs> um, well, anyway, so when you pray for those people, it relinquishes a lot of the resentment because you realize people are just struggling in this world. They're struggling. Sometimes they're confused. Sometimes they're, you know, people are just trying to find happiness and joy. And what good, if they're going to hate you, what good is to hate back? That's petty. We're not in the game of pettiness. That's, that's like uh, one dog fighting another dog. We got to be much above that. So just by those prayers... And I don't know why they came out, but they spontaneously came out. I felt so free to wish them well. Mm. You know? That was just today? That was just this morning. Nice. I can help you. Do you need help? I do. With some of this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's one thing. Okay. And then on, on the short term, I was thinking that, you know, with resentment, we got to be catch, our, catch ourselves quick as well. Like sometimes people do things like today. It's not just something that happened years ago. Sometimes today people... You know, people screw with us, uh, hurt us, cheat us. And so uh, immediately and completely, that's the game with resentment. Hmm. Immediately and completely. You can't can't sort of forgive them. Sometimes I, I forgive them. I just don't want to deal with them again. That's not a forgiveness. So you got to really, you got to think that through. And you got to, it's got to be complete in its forgiveness. Because if there's any residual for resentment, it becomes like sauerkraut. You ever make sauerkraut, Kostuba? I've eaten sauerkraut. Okay, you chop it, you chop up cabbage, you just stamp it up, and you cover it with a cloth, and you put it somewhere reasonably warm, like in a closet or something in your house. You salt it. Thank you, Mara, the chef. <laughs> <laughs> and and you forget about it until one day you come home and you're like, what the hell smells in this house? And you're like, oh, the sauerkraut's ready. <laughs> So this is what happens to resentment. If you don't deal with it immediately and completely, it ferments and it takes up your whole consciousness and it creates a very low ceiling for our spiritual evolution. Don't matter how many kirtans you go to, don't matter how many, um, you know, uh, 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 holy places you visit, pilgrimages you go on to. If I can't let go of resentment, I'm not going to get very far. I'm going to have a leash that ties me to this world. You won't be able to meditate. You won't be able to meditate. Yeah. yeah. Take up too much space. Yeah. So I don't know if that helped at all, but that's my answer, Kastuba. I got two things I want to get into. First, I wanted to read something that we read on the show like four years ago. By Yudhisthira from the Mahabharat. Boom. Bingo. I got that. Bingo. Did you see it on my screen? I did not. Okay. I remember it. I have a short and, memory. And then, and you and I were speaking a little bit yesterday, Katie, but you know, I've, I've been studying just this one point about compassion and forgiveness and humility, the, uh, something shared by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, great, great Bhakti yogi saint. And uh, it's it's taken me a little deeper into trying to penetrate into understanding these topics. So we'll, we'll get to that second. But let's read this thing about Yudhishthira. This is from Mahabharata. You know, Yudhishthira, he, Draupadi was so abused by Duryodhana and the Korvas. She just couldn't understand how Yudhishthira could be so forgiving, her own husband. And Yudhishthira is trying to explain to her what forgiveness is. And it's a very fascinating conversation. 
And when you get it, then when I talk about the second thing I'm going to talk about, I think Yudhishthir's mindset may become more clear. But let's just read what he says, because just what he says is so valuable. Yudhishthir, the great king, uh, elder brother of Arjuna from the Bhagavad Gita. So Yudhishthir was questioned by Draupadi about his forgiving nature. He had lost his kingdom, all the riches. He lost himself even, right? his brothers and his wife, yet his mood toward the core of us was always forgiving. They cheated him. They were so cruel to him. How could he be so docile, right? He's a warrior. Mm. How could he be so weak? She's saying like this, you know, she's like warrior princess, Joe, you know, so she's like, come on, fight, you know? Her point was that under no circumstances should you show and should you show forgiveness towards your enemies. It didn't matter whether Yudhishthir won or lost the battle, but he should maintain his pride and he should fight. Draupadi then refers, okay, so then they talk about, they're referring to something in Shastra, in the ancient text, that was uh, Bali presented a question to Prahlad on this topic, and then Yudhishthir goes into that. But this is what Yudhishthir says. He says, forgiveness is virtue, right? Just forgiveness itself is so virtuous. Forgiveness is sacrifice. Like, you know, they have these Vedic sacrifices where you spend so much time and energy to collect the ingredients and chant the mantras just right and do. But just forgiveness, if you could just forgive that, that's more meaning, like a more meaningful sacrifice. Forgiveness is the Vedas. Forgiveness is the Shruti, right? The oldest, most authoritative texts Forgiveness is like, it's in it. It's, it can't be separated from it, you know? For those who, for those who know, those who know this are capable of forgiving, forgiving everything. Forgiveness is Brahman, the spiritual energy. Forgiveness is truth. Forgiveness is stored ascetic merit. If you can just forgive, it's the same thing as being able to walk up into these mountains and leave the world behind. If you can actually give, leave your resentment behind, it's the same thing as being able to leave the world behind. You know, you're free. Forgiveness is, a, is asceticism. Forgiveness is holiness. And it is by forgiveness that the universe is held together. Without forgiveness, we will just all fight with each other and just ruin everything. Persons that are forgiving attain to the regions obtainable by those who have performed meritorious sacrifices. And those that are well conversant with the Vedas or those that have high ascetic merit, those that perform Vedic sacrifices, as also, also those who perform the meritorious rites of religion, obtain the higher religions, regions, and those of forgiveness, however, obtain those much adored regions in the world of Brahman, in the spiritual realm. Forgiveness is the might of the mighty. Forgiveness is sacrifice. And then this is the big one right here. Right? Forgiveness is a quiet mind. Right. Without it's it's not that you're doing the person that you're forgiving some big favor. You're letting go of what's weighing you down. You're letting go of the loops, the mental loops that your mind goes through when it can't let go of resentment. You'll never be able to sit. You'll never be able to meditate. You'll never be able to absorb your mind in sacred sound, in mantra, or in any other form of meditation until you clear your mind of that loop of resentment. You forgive and you're free. You know, so um, th that was some of what Yudhishthir said about forgiveness. Now, we had Dunya on the show a few, two, three weeks ago, something like that, and we got into forgiveness. She's so insightful, and she shared something that then when I read this from Bhakti Manoj Thakur, it kind of like confirmed what she was saying, where she was saying that forgiveness is not something that you just choose to do. You can do that on a superficial level. You can just do that. But in one sense, real, thorough, complete forgiveness is something that you kind of receive like a blessing. It's, you understand? It's not that we can just demand, just like we can't demand bhakti. We can't de demand divine love. We can't just, or we can't just decide. We can decide to practice bhakti, but we can't just decide to have divine love manifest fully in our hearts. That's something that comes with 
a blessing that descends on you and, and then arises in your heart. And this is the thing. And, and this is what's being said in this text by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakura, that humility and compassion. The question, what he, he's writing in his book, Jaiva Dharma, the question is being asked, does it, does it require humility and compassion to attain to bhakti? And you, you might think, yeah, right? How can you get bhakti if you don't have? But you can practice humility and um, you can practice compassion, but you don't really have the full um, essential humility and until you have bhakti because humility and compassion are in bhakti. So you don't need to have them to get bhakti, but when you have bhakti, you have them. And then he shares this fascinating idea that when when the heart is soft, melted, and you turn to Krishna, you feel love. And if you take that same heart, soft heart, that that when it looks at Krishna, feels love, and you turn it towards everybody else in the world, it manifests as compassion. That same love is compassion. So therefore, if you don't feel compassion for others, you don't have bhakti. Right. I was thinking about this, like, you know, like we're here in Rishikesh, right? And we're thinking, these are the hills where yogis have come for thousands of years to meditate and go deep into life, where people left behind the world and wandered up to these hills to, to go deeper and deeper, deeper into spiritual thought, to get away from the world and have the peace and, and the right atmosphere to go deep inside. Deep and Deep into various cafes. Well, or bungee jumping or, you know, like, like why do they bring these things here? People that have no understanding about what this place is all about for literally thousands and thousands of years think, oh, let me make some money and let me throw, and, and inside me, I could feel a little animosity, mm -hmm. <laughs> animosity towards someone that would do that. Who the hell do they think they are doing? And then I thought, I said, that is evidence that bhakti hasn't fully risen in my heart mm -hmm. because if it had, then when I looked at that, rather than thinking those creeps that did, I would be feeling like, it's so sad that they didn't understand enough of what this place is. I wish they could. That would be, then you would respond with compassion. Compassion. <laughs> yes. Right. Compassion. They're good people. Yeah. Okay. So then forgiveness, right? For, for, he, he places forgiveness right in there with them. As a matter of fact, he places forgiveness right between, he says it lands in the space between humility and compassion. Because if you have humility, then you think, who am I to hold resentment towards anyone, right? All of the stuff I've done in this life and all these different lives, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no special perfect person. Why should I hold resentment towards someone who's done something, even wronged me? And then on the other side of that um, is compassion. Like if by nature you want nothing but good for others, then forgiveness falls right in between. Right, like I can't blame them for anything, even they've done me wrong, and I want only good for them. So then, forgiveness is what has to be right in the middle. So I forgive them. Mm -hmm. I have no resentment towards them. I let go of anything. So that's so. In a sense, your question about like how do we? What is the key to it? In one sense, we can say the key is to develop bhakti. Then you will have forgiveness. But again, we can practice bhakti, and so similarly, we can practice compassion, and we can practice humility, and we can practice forgiveness. Um, trying to respond as someone who has pure bhakti in their heart would respond in this circumstance. It may be a little difficult. It may be I have to remind myself. But every time you do it, you take a step closer. Your mind becomes more accustomed to it. You feel the relief of it yourself in your mind and heart. You realize the benefit of it. And it becomes easier and easier and easier. You're, you have a, one of your... Um, pillars about forgiveness right isn't it one yeah. about forgiveness take no, take take no, no offense. offense take no offense, take no offense right take, apologize also yeah yeah on the other side but one thing i wanted to say is just because we forgive doesn't mean we invite crazy back into our life you know a lot of times it takes a lot of work to get crazy out of our life <laughs> and well i'm gonna forgive them because i'm so burning with resentment i'll just say it's okay to come back no crazy uh, uh, uh 
you can forgive and still have a person arrested. Boundaries. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Forgive and have them arrested. Yes, that's that's your takeaway today. <laughs> but, you know, they also use that analogy like it's like a hot coal you have. Or like they say that about anger, but we could say it about resentment, right? You're holding on to it. No, it, it's not the person that you're resenting that it's burning. It's burning you when you're holding on to it. So you begin to realize, the yogis realize, why should I hold on to it? I forgive. And the moment that I forgive, I'm free. And then my mind, my mind and my heart are peaceful. The yogi, you know, they come. We saw, we saw a sadhu today at that Vaishishta Guha. Yeah. And we had to walk up the path, like right past him. He was sitting, so literally we almost, right. you know, rubbed into him. You could look into his face. You could look into his eyes. And he had a glow. And as we walked past, he, he had no response, but not like in a cold way, but you could feel his gravity. You, know, you could feel his gravity that this, this man, there's no nonsense in his head. There's none of the garbage television shows and ridiculous music and all of the, or what to speak of, resentments, you know, um, uh, uh, holding on to grudges or anything petty. You know, you could just feel like he's let go of that stuff. That's why he's sitting in that grave state of mind that he's in, you know? Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. Otherwise, he'd be responding in some way to us, maybe friendly, maybe cold, whatever. But he was just like, he was in his groove. You know, we, we need to get in our groove. You know? These Every yoga practice we do has to go hand in hand with the philosophical study, too. So like we do a lot of kirtan in our program. Kirtan goes hand in hand with philosophy. I'm just doing kirtan and forget the philosophy. We're not going to learn to sort of like, we got to focus on this thing. This thing's burning me up here. And don't expect the kirtan train to pull me along if I'm like anchored to some resentment that happened last week or 20 years ago. And you should understand if you were hurt 20 years ago or 10 years ago, that's like a sapling that has grown deeper and deeper roots to the how long it went back in time that thing's taken on now it's become a tree you know so it's a little bit harder to excavate or you know really pull out that's why quick ones you can just practice pulling out as soon as they happen they let go of it quick but ones that have been there and then i've thought about and i've played my hurt over and over in my head i've shared my hurt with friends and therapists etc those are like they become deep rooted and they're right. much hard, more difficult to get out. You got a few deep rooted ones in there. Um, not not on purpose. So yeah. I had a lot of time, you know, before coming to Bhakti and a lot of different experiences. Actually, I really appreciate uh, Ravi what you said about praying in the Ganga because that's actually what I was doing today too. Not only was I appreciating um, you and Kastuba and all of my teachers, but then also I was praying for the people who have essentially made me who I am and pushed me to like this, uh, like being so strong and or being so eager for this path of bhakti in a sense and um, praying for all those people to, uh, what's it called? Find connection with God. Cause in a sense, you know, one moment. Yeah. Yeah. Did we lose? Oh. Are <laughs> we just, we hardwired in this or we, yeah, we're hardwired. Oh, we're hardwired. Okay. But why did our screen are the other people? Are still you got, Dan Murphy, can you hear me here? He says yes. yes. We got to keep talking. Okay, so our Sorry. screen froze. So our screen froze. Okay, please continue about your deepest resentments in life <laughs> and the, your deepest Remember pain. You got like, oh, this resentment right now. <laughs> yes. Well, that's why I, I so greatly appreciate both of you guys' answer. I feel like um, after so many years on this earth, which really isn't that much in compared to other or uh, some others. What do you mean I'm... by that? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. How old do you think we are? <laughs> but um. Well, I, you know how everyone's like, oh, you're so young, you're so young. And I feel like I've lived so many lifetimes already in a sense. Sure. Um, but yeah, it uh this uh, I feel like I had a multi-layered, like multi-layered like um feelings about about forgiveness and about like trying to let go of resentment and practicing. And I feel like you guys both hit the nail on the head in multiple different ways that and I really appreciate you guys for that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Katie. Thanks. We love having you, Katie. Let's yeah. hear it for Katie. All right, Bo. <laughs> All right, the next contestant on, I think it's Lori Pag. Come on down, Lori Pag, from Newport, Rhode Island. Lori's a veteran of India. She's been here millions of times. 
She goes deeper and deeper and more connected. She never misses the Bhagavatam every day. Unbelievable for maybe five years now. Yeah, podcast every morning. Every morning. Welcome. And she started, she broke out a part of her personality we never knew existed, but she started leading Kirtan. Oh. And she is quite talented. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what Laura, is- what's your question? How can we serve you? So I've come to India several times, I think 10 pilgrimages now since 2016. Okay, not quite a million. No, 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 no. a lot, a little bit of spiritual greed. <laughs> um, and my first time coming to temple was in Vrindavan at Krishna Balaram Temple. Mm. And in the morning RT, they did the song Viva Varishesha. Yep. And then when I attend other temples, that's not the morning song. So why is the morning song different? In different temples, we could answer that question. Good question. It seems like aren't you guys following the same? Why is everything different? Yeah. Good question. Right. Okay. Um, I think the idea is that morning artiques have or morning programs. I mean, Prabhupada, who's our guru's guru, set up set up this very wonderful way to have a morning program, and it hits on hearing the Bhagavatam. Yeah. Worshipping the deity, mm-hmm. worshipping the guru, mm-hmm. and worshipping Tulsi. Yeah. And covering all those things in one program. Every temple is going to be uniquely different on the songs they sing. The idea is we're worshipping guru. But not in that morning God. program. Huh? Not in that morning program. Oh, you mean t- all I'm temples? Every temple discuss- is going to be slightly different depending what, what lineage they have. Okay, sure. And um, But the idea, the principles are the same. The, the, the songs are the details. But the principle is we worship God, we worship Guru, and, and we, we study the Srimad Bhagavatam. In Bhakti temples, you're going to study the Bhagavatam. Mm-hmm. And so you'll generally see that in Bhakti temples wherever you go as part of their regular morning sadhana. But there's a very practical reason to her question. In the Vrindavan temple, why oh, this... oh, why that particular song? Yeah. All right, so you're, if you're asking about ISKCON particular temples, Prabhupada's temples that particular temple is yeah. well the, the, you see the song that that we generally sing the guru vastakam which is prayers to the guru um that song is sung because shil Prabhupada's samadhi mandir his tomb is there on that property so they sing that song to him just before you understand so like so if you come 15 minutes earlier and go to his samadhi they sing that song there now you've already sung that, so you're not going to sing it twice. So then they bring in this very beautiful song by Bhakti Vinod Thakur Viva Varishi, which is a song about waking up and singing the names of God. Mm. Beautiful song. Such a beautiful Great song. song too. Yeah, yeah, that's the answer. Thank you so much. No All right. Problem. Now you know. Thank you. And you got to get up 15 minutes earlier next time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear it for Lori Pag. Lori Pag. Love her. Empowered yoga teacher. <laughs> Newport, Rhode Island. How, well, how, so about, how about any of the, the guests here that are just uh, not... Oh, wait, that was hey. Good save, Lori. Nice. <laughs> Anybody here visiting have a question you want to ask? Don't be Ladies, shy. violinists? <laughs> no? Okay, then we'll stick with our people. Well, you're all our people. But... Yes. Now, Ferdy's got a question. Okay. He's going to jump the line. That's okay, Ferdy. <laughs> Come on, Ferdy. Let's hear Come it for Ferdy. He's a pleasure. Ferdy from San Diego, California. Hi, Hi, everyone. <laughs> and did did you tell us your story last week? What's your story again? Uh, you, you, do you really want to hear my story? Well, not the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> your well, story I, in three lines. Well, I found Bhakti because of my wonderful harmonium teacher, Seth Lieberman. He introduced oh, yes. me to Wisdom yeah. of the Sages, and it's because of the um, the podcast and the influence that I've learned through your teachings. Um, it's really guided me into... Um, this beautiful practice of mine that I'm still very much learning today, but to be on Yatra with you all has definitely influenced me in, 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 in deeper ways. I feel so immersed in my practice now. And that is one of the questions that I do have about my sadhana. Yeah, sure. So, you know, so, you know, we've been to a few um, artis, art, artis, Ar- artis. artis. And, um, as a fairly new bhakta, in the morning, when I do my morning sadhana, I often wonder, how do I give the right reverence, the right 
you know, um, obeisances towards the guru, towards Krishna in the morning? Is there mm. a specific um, practice that I should do? You yeah. mean in a in a temple atmosphere or, or, or in, in your my, hotel room? In my, in my or your... home or yeah, no, yeah. So like, do I need to take the the lamp and do I need to do that? Good question. Or... Or because typically what I do is the invocation, the Mangala Charana. Well, that's nice. Every morning and every evening. Auspicious I prayers to the Guru, to Chaitanya, to Krishna, to Radha. That's but very I, nice. But I'm not sure if there's supposed to be something else I should be doing in order to really um, pay the most respect. Very good question. Good question. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Ferdy. Would you like to start? Um, as soon as I jump out of bed, I offer prayer to all my teachers. Om Ajnana or other prayers, Namashresta, Manumapi Sachi Putram. You know, so it's just it's a it's just a nice way to start your day. Sometimes I'll say, Oh Krishna, what would you like for me today? Today, to, from this moment on, I'm yours, Krishna. What would you like for me today? That's like a first thing out of bed to recalibrate my brain after like six or to eight hours of just being in the mode of ignorance. You know, so that's nice to start your day like that. And then um try my utmost best before by the time i wake up and podcast start you know at home i wake up at four and then we have podcasts at six or seven so from that time to that time i try my best to only listen listen e either do japa meditation read or hear uplifting spiritual information you know so nothing goes in my head uh, that is not outside of that sadhana food super food for the consciousness um you know trying not to scroll or answer messages unless you know unless it's, it's something urgent but trying to even deal with my phone that much um but that's sort of like in general if you want to give more specific Ustuba. well let's uh, take it a little wide and then get more specific because it's a really good question because it gets to the heart of something important is that like the purpose of the details in the ritual right mm -hmm. uh we want to be in the right frame of mind or the right frame of heart we'll do the ritual. Otherwise, ritual has a tendency to become mechanical. And then you begin to wonder, yeah, rote, what are we doing here? You know? So um I I and, and what you said, Raghunath, reminded me of this. I, I think I've mentioned it on the show before, but once Cat in the box? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Forget it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like Cat in the box is a good one. <laughs> um, but uh I was once in a Rusby Hari Law shop uh, in Loy Bazaar in Vrindavan, which has a really nice book selection. And, you know, you just nose around there and you kind of see, you know, is there something interesting here, right? There's a great library to go through. I found this really old book. It was like so old. It was like really dusty in there. Yeah, they've got some really old stuff with the old fashioned <laughs> Indian printing with the letters are backwards. It was falling apart. Yeah. It had this really cool cover, and even the cover was kind of falling apart. But it had a—it was kind of like a close-up of this Brahmin. What was it called? The book. It was called. It was. It wasn't exactly this, but essentially it was this. It was like the lifestyle of the Sri Vaishnava Brahmanas. It wasn't called the lifestyle of that. I'm thinking of the lifestyle of the rich and famous. But it was. <laughs> it was like the. <laughs> the lifestyle. <laughs> but Brahmanas. it was something like the daily practices of the of the Sri Vaishnava Brahmanas. The cribs which of is the South Indian Brahmanas. <laughs> <laughs> so so it was um a book that documented in detail every moment of their day from the time they wake up to the time they go to sleep. And, and you could see that their whole day was like set up rigidly with like exactly what you're supposed to be doing in your mind, exactly what mantra you're supposed to be chanting at every step in order to bring their mind to the place that they want to keep it rather than let it drift off in different directions, in order to nurture, cultivate the attitudes and the sentiments that they want to be in their mind and their heart. Did you buy that book? Did you buy yeah, the book? Yeah, I got it. You got it. Yeah. You should bring it in and just read it. Uh, read parts of it. I don't, I mean, it's in New York. Yeah, right no, right? yeah. yeah we could, we could. I mean, it's telling you everything in there from like how to go to the bathroom and what you should be chanting in your mind. You know, it's like it's very detailed. Yeah. Acquiring minds want to know. And so like it starts the day, like the moment you wake up, you chant Lord Vishnu's name and you don't lie around in bed, right? You immediately get up. And you got that? Do you lie around in bed? Do you like, oh, God. 
Uh, a little bit. You hit no, no. You hit that <laughs> snooze button a couple times. You know when Raghunath and I were brahmacharis monks. You know we were trained that you don't you don't lie around in the sleeping bag. You know we sleep on the floor. You know you don't lie around after the alarm goes off. You jump up. You know you just go right. They say that you can learn different qualities from the dog. I think it was Chanya Pandit. Yeah, from the dog. And there's loyalty and so, but one of the things you can learn from from the dog is, the moment it wakes up, it's alert, right? Dogs don't. Maybe Gus is a little different. Dog's a little old. <laughs> He's moving slower, but a dog will wake up and boom, it's ready to ready for action. So we were trained that you you wake up, boom, you jump right out of bed. You don't let your mind go thinking. You don't go into your dreams. Like, what was I dreaming? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you try to go back into on. the dream. Yeah, no, you just <laughs> jump up and you go. I got a feeling you're sort of a morning person. I'm getting there. You got, okay. My, my sadhana is definitely helping me with that. Yeah. Talk Good. Like, sir. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. He said his sadhana is getting him there. Okay. Yeah. So so the first thing, as soon as you wake up, you chant Lord Vishnu's name, and then you immediately get out, or get up. But it said the first, as you're about to, to put your foot on the ground for the first time in the day. Oh, I like this one. Mm -hmm. First, you don't put your left foot. Never. Right. <laughs> Raghunath would wake up early it off. just so that he could criticize anyone that puts it. What? You're wrong. Now I'm going to be thinking about you every morning. <laughs> no. So our morning is going to be Vishnu. I'm just going to hear Vishnu, Vishnu, Vishnu. And, you know, particularly in South India, they worship Narayan, they worship Vishnu, and they worship him not with one wife, but with two wives, right? One is Sri or Lakshmi Devi, and the other wife is Boo. Boo, the earth, Mother Earth. So Mother Earth is it, particularly in their lineage that she's important. So before you place your feet on the earth for the first moment in the morning, you, as you're placing your right foot down out of respect, not your left foot, you chant a prayer that is essentially says, dear Mother Earth, please forgive me for placing my feet on you, but may I do it May each, all of my steps in this day all be in the service of your Lord, Lord Vishnu. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Yeah. So just think if you do that every day and you don't just do it mechanically, but you actually like reach into your heart and say it every day, first thing in the morning, how is that going to affect your mind? How is that going to affect your heart? You know? So that was the idea that every detail has meaning to it. And then it went up what you're supposed to be saying when you're in the shower, what you're just chanting when you're brushing your teeth, like everything had like intention behind it, specific intention behind it. How really, you brush your teeth. <laughs> oh, <my God>. Up <laughs> and down. <laughs> chanted, he's brushing his teeth and he's thinking of like a Crest commercial from 1971. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so, so, uh, so your question was when you're doing your puja, which is like, yeah, now I'm actually doing the ritual, which is all all the more it's like you're very concerned with. It's all about specifically nothing but drawing your mind in, in a very intentional way. So, you know, um, there's so many, they're called archana padatis. Uh, pad, you know, pada means step. So the steps that you take in your archana, in, in the worship of the archana morti, in the, in the worship of the deity. Um, and they can be elaborate or they can be simple. Now, someone in your case, you're probably going to want it to be simple, right? We're not, you're not a priest in a temple that's a thousand years old that has this very elaborate system. You need something simple, but real. It's got to be simple enough so that you can do it and do it, uh, not neglect it. Um, but it's got to be real enough that it kind of like affects you, right? Yeah. So, so generally no matter no matter who's doing it on whatever level, there's some what they call buta shuddhi. Yeah, there's some kind of releasing or purifying of the conception of the self because we're moving around all day with a certain identity, right? I am man, woman, black, white, American, this, that, you know, there's my job, there's my occupation, there's all my social roles. I walk around all day in a state of mind like that's me. And so Bhutta Shuddhi means like, no, 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 that isn't actually who I am. That's the roles that I'm playing for a very temporary moment in time that I will let go of at the time of death or even before then. And while I'm doing this ritual, I want my mind not to be in those temporary identities. I want it to be in my eternal identity. 
So I want, and, and you know, like in some temples, you see priests before they do this, their seva, they're doing pranayama, you know, settling their mind. Then they're chanting elaborate mantras. They may do a puja shuddhi for half an hour or an hour, you know. But uh, in one archana padati, very simple one, and this is the one in, in my home that my wife and I follow. There's just one simple prayer. And it was uh, spoken by Sri Chaitanya. I'm not a Brahmana. I am not a Chachya, I'm not a Vaishya, I'm not a Shudra. I'm not a Brahmachari, I'm not a Grihasta, I'm not a Vanaprastha, I'm not a Sannyasi. So essentially what he's saying is I'm not any of the social roles that people play in this world. That's not me. I am simply, do you know what he says? I do not. He says, Gopi Bhartha Kamala Yor Dasa Dasa Anudasa. I am the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna, the lover of the gopis. Right? That's who I am eternally. I'm not, I'm not man, woman, black, white, even American, even human exactly, right? I am eternally a servant of Krishna. While I do this ritual, I want to be operating on that platform. I want my mind to be absorbed there. I want to forget about everything else, past, future, be absorbed right in this moment in my eternal identity. That's, that's what I'm cultivating through this daily ritual. And then comes the question of guru, which is the question that you brought up. Is, is guru right. Kirk? Yeah. So like, even within our lineage, you get different people doing things with different steps. But what I could recommend to you is that the idea is that I don't approach Krishna directly. I'm the servant of the servant of the servant, right? I don't, I don't have the adhikar. I don't have the qualification to approach Krishna directly. So I approach Krishna through my guru, who, who then approaches through his and so on up the guru parampara up the the lineage right so therefore at the beginning of the worship there's there's prayers to the guru uh, it can just be one verse nama om vishnu padai like that you know mm -hmm. um and there's taking permission from the guru to do the seva you know i've collected the ingredients and, and, and in, in one sense i'm the one that's going to wave the incense and wave the the flower and all that. But in my mind, it's almost like I'm saying, here, Guru Dave, I brought this for you to offer. Like that. Right. That's yeah, that, that's kind of where the mind is at. Or it could be like, on behalf of you, I'm doing this, you know, like that. So in, in those prayers, there's even a picture of you picture in your mind, you chant a mantra where in your mind you picture your guru. It says dressed in white, sitting along with the Guru Parampara in Mayapur. You envision that, and then you do your seva. Like that. So let's talk about, let's get you something simple, something that you can memorize, chant, that captures the essence of that, and then you can do that as you enter into your seva. It can become incredibly yeah. complicated, or you can really break it down to simple, basic things according to your lifestyle, yeah. where you're at. Thank but you, you're, Papaji's. But you're serious now. I, so you can. I'm getting there. Yeah, <laughs> we we like to say at Wisdom of Sages, you have a little morning sadhana, you have a little evening sadhana. Yeah, yeah. Once you get your morning sadhana down, you got it wired. I'm doing this on a regular basis, then you can create an evening one. You sandwich in your whole work day with something spiritual instead of just coming home from work, sitting on the couch, turn on Netflix, drinking a beer. You you have your whole wind down, spiritual wind down. People get it, I think. Uh, morning recalibrate the brain, but that evening thing too is important as well. Well, as always, Prabhuji, thank you for your guidance. Thank, thank you. Purdy. <laughs> Purdy's a great name. <laughs> All right. It's uh, 51. We, got, we need one more question. We need one more. Sh okay. Jason Jordan. Come on up, Jason. Come on down, Jason. From New Jersey. <laughs> okay. I think it had first? something to do with the friend that you brought to the Brooklyn Temple. Has Jason been on yet? Yeah, there was. Yeah, Did you introduce you publicly in, yet? In Delhi. Okay. Meet the pilgrim, Jason, old hardcore guy yeah, from man. Philly back in the day. Okay. Something happened to your camera. All right. You pulled the mic. Hey, Dad. Went out, Mara. <laughs> Camera's out. Can they see us? Uh, Dan, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see us? Or you just see our little mic? No one can see us. It says wisdom of sages. Anyway, you can ask the question, though. Are you sure? Yeah. Jason <laughs> from New Jersey. Well, New York now. And New York. Yeah. Um, okay, so recently I had a friend who was interested in bhakti, 
and I took her to Radha Govinda in Brooklyn and we had a nice meal at Govinda's and she's like, this is incredible. Where do I start? <laughs> and I went, oh my God, I've been doing this for 34 years. I don't really know what to tell you, you know, like easy does it, you know, cause there's a lot to, a lot to digest. Right. And I'm still digesting even 34 years into it. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of wondering where I can tell somebody how to begin a life mm-hmm. in Bhakti. That's all. Good question. Yeah. Good question. Jason Jordan. Good question. Um, you should say, have you read uh, R- Raghunath's book? Punk's a- <laughs> Punk's a monk? I was going to say, uh, have you heard Punk's of this podcast? I was going to say, well, I will say the podcast makes the Bhagavatam very accessible um, because it's not very official. Sometimes you go to a Bhagavatam class and uh, people don't jibe with it. There's so much prayers that are going on before that it create a little blockage, you know? So the podcast, we make it ex- especially accessible. We try to keep it accessible. We try to make it relevant and practical. And then, of course, uh, my book is, I will say, it's sort of Krishna Conscious for Dummies, my life story. That would I, be a good thing, like the Krishna Conscious for Dummies book. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah. I'm well, kind of working on it. Yeah, we're. <laughs> And it's, you know, I'm, I'm working. Mine's on... already it. I just said mine is, <laughs> and you said yeah, we need one. Then you said I'm working on it. Come on. No, but yours is a is a memoir. One that's not a I memoir, know, but, but the... that's you learn from people's experience. We all it, love your book, Raghunath. We will buy your philosophy. Buy your two of Raghunath's books. <laughs> so Raghunath Swami's book too. Also, it's a it's a memoir, but you you under start to understand the philosophy through the life story and the teachings and the stuff he was going through, etc. Those are good. Or you keep it very simple. Say, so, you know, you just, you know, you could say, you know, get one of those those malas and just try chanting, sitting in a quiet place and try chanting one round of the Maha Mantra on these beads every day and see how that goes for a month. See if you can commit to a month for it. But the truthful is they won't be able to keep it up for a month unless they are reading Punk to Monk or something like that. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it's the only way that it'll work. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> But you know what I mean? In order to keep up chanting, you need philosophy that goes with it. Why you're doing it. Everybody's looking for a why. Yeah. The why, why, why of spiritual life. And but but if they do read with that chanting, Krishna will see that. And Krishna is a real being. It's it, Krishna is a real reciprocal energy, a reciprocal force, a reciprocal person that will reciprocate with your desire. Right. That's what reciprocal beings do. They reciprocate <laughs> all the time. Yeah. What do you think, Hostuba? I think that although I haven't met your friend, I know one thing about her. And it's a huge advantage. She has you as a friend. Oh. Right. And and, <laughs> and that means that um you can help her because everybody's different. Some people are going to dive right into it and they're just ready to go. And some people are going to be very, their minds are going to have to be satisfied at every step. You know, um, I, Jiva G life coach, she was my old friend when we were kids. And then I didn't see her for 30 years. And then she wrote me on Facebook, like, uh, how do I find a guru? <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, you and I have to talk. And then for about a year and a half, I spent an hour or so with her every, once a week just kind of explaining everything step by step by step by step by step. She needed that much information to fully invest herself in it, you know? And sometimes Krishna tags you or yeah. me or Kristuba or something to talk a language to a person that only they, they could only hear it from you. They couldn't maybe hear right. it from anybody else for now. I found that in my, on my journey, it's like, I didn't get any of these people, but this one person, he makes sense to me. Yeah, You know what I mean? And then from then, more people made sense to me. So you're that person. You've been tagged by God for her. And, and you know, some people, um, it's like kirtan is a thing. You know, you just throw them into the kirtan. They're going to be really excited and they're going to just want to keep coming back. Or some people might look at the kirtan and say, I don't really get that. Um, their their attraction is on some, maybe they're into the philosophy. Um, but even th- some people... Every cultural kind of a distinction is a potential pitfall or potential obstacle. Some people are like every cultural distinction is like totally a turn on, you know. Right. So like everybody's different, but because you know this person, you're 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 equipped to help them navigate it. Um, but other than that, I would have to say punk to monk would be the way to go. 
<laughs> double it. <laughs> you already got it. You double it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's it, Miss Mara. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. All the guests. If you haven't heard of Wisdom of the Sages, now's your chance. Get it wherever you get podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. And in the meantime, hit it, Mara. Hit it, Mara. There we go. We're back at the same time tomorrow with another Q and A. So if anybody was here and they really did have a question, but what you try to ask, tomorrow's day. Clap, but clap on beat. Thanks, everybody. Beautiful day, but a beautiful day. Let the magic continue to flow. Zoomers, we'll see you in the